Sheldon Levy started us off this morning with a quote, and there was a word in the quote that caught my eye. Make no little plans. They have no magic to stir the blood and probably will not be realized. Make big plans. Aim high in hope and work. Christmas 1993. Power Rangers and Super Nintendo are on the minds of every child in the world. However, this four-year-old has only one thing on his Christmas list, a magic wand. A month goes by and Christmas rolls up and sure enough, underneath the Christmas tree, his very own magic wand. Now I would say the wand itself lasted about a week before the tin foil deteriorated and the pencil cracked. However, that was one magical week. I didn't say anything for an entire year about the whole fake wand thing until November came around again and I was drafting my first draft of my Christmas list. And of course this year I did not just rely on the magic wand I learned from my mistake from the previous year. However, the number one thing on my list, again, was a magic wand. Only in brackets next to it, it read. <laughs> 1993 was a very important year for me, magically speaking. Mainly because of the release of a very important film. Now, Hocus Pocus, should any of you be tragically unaware of the majesty of this modern classic, Hocus Pocus is a Disney musical comedy about three witches. Bette Midler, Kathy Jimmy, and Sarah Jessica Parker. <laughs> now, to preface the story, Hocus Pocus wasn't just some... Uh, holiday classic that I couldn't wait until next year to watch. No, Hocus Pocus came out at Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, my birthday, Mother's Day, Father's Day, any opportunity I had to watch this film, I took. And for whatever reason, Sarah Jessica Parker caught my eye. To the point where that year I did not go as um, a witch for Halloween, but I went as Sarah Jessica Parker's <laughs> version as a witch for Halloween. I was an only child and most of my games revolved around being alone and using my imagination. And some of the games I would play involved playing as these witches or like fighting these witches or whatever. And um, Sarah Jessica Parker was the one that was calling to me. Okay, we're jumping ahead now. I'm eight years old, I'm uh, living in New York and I'm walking down Broadway with my mom. And we look up to see a gigantic po poster of SJP's face, Sarah Jessica Parker. <laughs> and she's advertising her performance in the off-Broadway musical Once Upon a Mattress. Everything in New York stops for me because I have to see this play. I run home that night, I get out my crayons, my markers, pencils, whatever I have, my paper, and I, I just start drawing and sketching. And I start sketching out pictures of Sarah Jessica Parker at every stage in her career. I bind them into a portfolio book and with the anticipation of bringing them to her the next day. But as I'm drawing these pictures, there's something going through my head. I am actually envisioning meeting Sarah the next day. There is, it feels as if there is nothing at all stopping me from meeting her. By drawing these pictures, I'm drawing her into reality for me, or at least that's what it feels like when I'm drawing them. I wake up at 4 a.m. to get, I go to the box office at, at 6 in order to get the tickets to the matinee, and while I do, I exchange my portfolio for my tickets I hope, in hopes that they will deliver it to Sarah. I see the show, it's fabulous. I don't really actually remember anything about it whatsoever. <laughs> However, afterwards, Afterwards being the important part. A little inside tip for celebrities talking. If you go to the backstage door of a theater after the performance, that's where the stars will leave and sign autographs and take pictures with the screaming fans. Obviously, I was going to do this. That was, in fact, the only reason I was there in the first place. So I'm standing outside the backstage door, clutching my program, waiting for the, for the door to open and Sarah to be revealed. 
And finally, the door does swing open. But it's not Sarah. It's someone else. It's the stage manager. And she's telling me, along with all the other countless Hocus Pocus fans, as I'm sure that's what they were, <laughs> that Sarah is tired. And that because this is a matinee and she has another show in a few hours, instead of coming out to sign autographs, she's going to take a nap. You can hear the audible sound of my heart breaking in Canada. I was miserable, and it was, I, like, I took it all to blame. It was all my fault. Of course Sarah is going to be tired. She is a brilliant performer. She needs her rest. <laughs> How could I be so stupid? The stage manager offers this shitty compromise where if I hand in my program, she'll take it into the backstage along with all the others, have them signed, likely by her, and then return to us. <laughs> I'm obviously less than enthusiastic about this option. And I'm probably the last person to actually go up to um, hand in my program. And I don't know, I, I think I'm feeling like a little resentful or something. I'm just like, or maybe even just a bit bold. And as I'm going up, I hand up my program to her. And I don't let go. <laughs> so we're both gripping the program. <laughs> and I say, I'm Stephen Dunn. And she says, are you the kid who drew the pictures? And I say, yes. And she says, she's been waiting for you. <laughs> Sarah Jessica Parker <laughs> has been waiting for me. Before I can catch my breath, I'm swooped into the backstage and put in this corner where I'm out of the way of the dancers and stage crew who are bustling about, and within one minute, Sarah herself descends the steps. She's wearing, a, she's wearing her hair in a ponytail and a jean jacket and her sunglasses indoors, as that's the fashionable thing for celebrities to do in the 90s. And then she's there, talking to me, acknowledging my presence. She says she loved the portfolio. In fact, she's going to put it up when she gets home. I can just imagine her and Matthew Broderick sitting home with their feet up, with their hot chocolates flipping through my portfolio book. <laughs> she gives me some great career advice because I'm, I'm a, doing the child acting thing at the time. And she just gives me some really supportive advice from, you know, not only someone who's in the business, but someone who's Sarah Jessica Parker. And then I leave. And that's it. I, my five minutes are up. And I move on with my life, and I'm sure Sarah did as well. <laughs> but I didn't realize until years later that this would be the most profound moment for me in my formative years. Now, I'm not delusional. I know that Sarah probably has absolutely no memory of this ever happening. And to be honest, I don't remember her performance, so I guess we're even. But what I took from this lasted so much longer than those five minutes. It was much deeper than that. At eight years old, I was able to meet my almost fictitious idol. I was able to come from Newfoundland, which is, you know, it's not so possible to meet Sarah Jessica Parker there. <laughs> and I was able to meet her at the power of my own crayons. It felt, oh, it just felt so powerful to be able to do that. It felt magical to be able to do that. Two years later, I moved back to Newfoundland. And something has changed with me. I have this sensibility that allows me to feel that no matter what I can imagine, no matter how insane they may, it, it may be, I can achieve it. And can you guess what the very first thing on my list is? to put off my very own version of Cats the Musical for my grade three talent show. <laughs> Wonderful, eh? Now I'm a filmmaker, a director. And when you think about it, what is it exactly that a filmmaker does? They translate their imagination into cinematic form. They, they manifest their imagination, their ideas, their concepts, no matter how ludicrous, impossible, or ambitious they may be, 
and they make them real for themselves and for other people. Now, when you think about that, it's not a very uncommon concept. An architect envisions a building before it's ever made. A choreographer sees a dance before it's performed. An entrepreneur see, envisions a company before it's ever founded. All of these are everyday examples of the imagination materializing. The imagination is the absolute most powerful thing that we have as human beings because it's limitless. And I don't care, I don't care what anyone else says, the ability to be able to translate that into something real is magic. I never did receive the magic wand that I asked for when I was five years old, the real one. But not for one day did I ever stop believing in magic. So, at 21, I would like to take it upon myself to redefine the definition of magic into something real. My writing partner, Mark Ben David, and I have this book in which we use in order to challenge each other. We fill it with assignments and homework in order to challenge each other artistically, creatively. And in the most recent transaction of the book, Mark asked me, what is magic, Stephen? Does it exist? And without thinking, I sort of went straight to the library and I, I, I just filled out the book organically with this, sorry, I'm jumping into your audience. I'm gonna read this now in a minute. But I, I just filled it with whatever came, what flowed out from my brain, sort of uncensored. Magic is liberating, dark, and almost impossible, but it rests inside the belly of every body. It is the materialization of the imagination. Artists are wizards, scientists are warlocks, inventors are the magicians. We are creators, therefore we have the power to stop time, heal flesh, build houses, and graze our wings beneath the clouds. We who wield the power of imagination float in alchemy, those who conjure these thoughts and ideas into something accessible to others are the ones that we call the sorcerers. Then I concluded by asking Mark, so, do you think magic exists? Look down at your own silver pen and wrap your fingers round your wand. So, audience, I ask you to look down at your own silver pens and wrap your fingers around your magic wand. Thank you.